Hello and welcome to Wakaiva Athletics broadcast production for live sports. This is an introductory presentation that is intended for a couple of purposes. First of all, uh, as a resource for our own broadcast production students who are interested in getting involved in producing live sports at Wakaiva. And secondly, to be a resource for any other sports programs, whether they are at the high school or other amateur level or any other level who are interested in getting started with producing live sports. We get a lot of questions at Wakaiva about how we do this, and there is no proprietary or secret information about it, so we're happy to share that with anyone else who would like to view these topics as well. So let's take a look at the topics for this presentation. First, the components of a broadcast production setup for live athletic events. What's involved in that? What kind of pieces and parts do you need? And how much do they cost? Then we'll give you some examples of complete builds. First, the minimal, least expensive setup that you can get away with and still produce something that is of reasonable quality. Um, I have always said, and we have followed this advice here at Wakaiva, that it is better to do less and do it well than to do more and do it poorly. Um, and so certainly Wakaiva has had a journey that you don't go zero to ESPN overnight. We're still not at the level that we could be, but we get a little better at it every year. And most other programs, I think, will find themselves in the same boat that, you know, you start with a, a single camera and a very simple setup. And then as you get better at that, you master it then you build your way up to having you know animated graphics and multi-camera setup and more sophisticated audio mixing and etc etc that you don't have to get to that level uh, just to get started um, but we will mention what Wakaiva's current setup is all the pieces and parts that we use and what the total cost of that would be uh, then once we get through that we'll talk about optimal camera positioning um, so that you can get the most professional look to your broadcast. And then finally, staffing priorities. Um, so obviously it's not just a matter of equipment resources, it's also a matter of human resources. And there are ways that you can get this accomplished with anywhere between zero to six people. Obviously a professional uh, production would have many more than that, but uh, even with only a small handful of people, you can get a pretty good product out at the amateur level. So let's talk about what the system topology looks like. What is this ecosystem involved? So the first thing is your video inputs. This is obviously the most important part because if you don't have video inputs, then you don't have a broadcast. Well, maybe you have a radio show, but that's about it. So this is obviously going to include one or more cameras and those cameras may or may not be attached to a hardware mixer. Um, we'll go through a couple of different options of how you can get those connected into your broadcast system. The more traditional way of doing this involves having those cameras connected to a physical um, hardware mixer and then the mixer will then send its output into the production machine. You don't have to do that though. You can also um, wire multiple cameras directly into your production machine and then use software mixing. Then we talk about your audio. Now, at the very most basic level, you may simply take the audio that's coming in from the cameras, because most cameras have a built-in microphone, and we'll send that audio um, through the same cable that's sending the video, and you can just get ambient crowd noise. And if that's as far as you go with it, then that's fine. But if you are going to have an announcer, or if you're going to be piping any music or other audio sources into your broadcast, then you may have microphones, headsets, or other devices that would in turn go into an audio mixer. Now, again, the audio mixer is technically optional. There are different cards that you can get for computers that allow you to plug in several audio sources and then mix it using software on the computer. Virtually nobody does that though, um, and the reason is because that gets really hard for the person operating the computer um, with a keyboard and a mouse to keep tabs on the video and the audio and mixing all of it at once. Um, it's so much easier to just use sliders to tweak your audio levels and if you need to cough to mute a microphone or something like that, so much easier to do that with a little hardware device that sits next to you and then you plug that mixed output as a single input into the computer. That's what the vast majority of people do. Then you have graphic data inputs, and this is particularly unique to sports production. 
Um, if you've watched any kind of college or professional sports on television, you now probably take for granted the presence of a scoreboard with live data about the score and the clock and maybe some other information as well. Uh, but at the amateur level, you often don't even know where to get started with trying to connect that stuff together. So um, this is a Dactronics All Sport 5000, but different high schools use different sports controllers. But in any case, most of the bigger name scoreboard controllers have some kind of output on them where you can connect them to a device that will take that data and pipe it somewhere. Um, what you see on your screen is a score link. Later on, I'll go into several different choices for how you can do that. So then you have your production system. In a professional setup, your production system may involve three, four, or more different computers, each of which is only handling one particular component of the broadcast, and then one final system that actually consolidates it all together and streams out the output. In a typical high school or amateur setting, you're probably going to have just one machine that's mixing everything together for you. Uh, and we'll talk about different choices for how you can do that. And then finally, you gotta get out of the room or off the field, and how are you gonna do that? You gotta get it to the internet somehow, and then once it does go to the internet, you have to decide where it's going to go on the internet. Are you gonna send it to YouTube or Facebook or somewhere else? Um, so we'll talk about the different options for doing that. Let's start with the first and most obvious section, which is the video inputs. Some considerations first. Any video camera will do but cameras that offer at least 1080p with good light sensitivity, autofocus, and optical zoom are ideal. Webcams are poor choices for live sports because they are designed to focus on subjects that are only a few feet away, have few to no zoom controls, and are difficult to mount on tripods. So if you've got your little Logitech webcam that you use for um, online classes and, and maybe, you know, VTC meetings, that's great for that. It's not great for shooting sports. You can do it, but it won't be a high quality output. Live output from whatever device you use is a must, and don't just assume that your camera comes with this. So consider what type of port the camera uses for live output of what's, what it sees, what the camera sees. Um, different cameras have micro HDMI, mini HDMI, full-sized HDMI, SDI, Ethernet, um, or some of them, the more expensive professional models, may even offer wireless, where you can send the video image live over a network. Um, so make sure you know what your camera has, because you may need an adapter or a specialty cable, and we'll go through some of the examples of that a little later. The ability to record within the camera, shuttle back and playback, to live output can give you a poor man's instant replay. Now in a professional world, you would have a dedicated person and a dedicated machine for capturing and playing back instant replay. Um, if you don't have that though, because almost nobody at this level does, um, you actually can kind of fake it as long as you have at least two cameras and they can, um, they can switch quickly into playback mode and then shuttle back and replay. Um, you actually can do instant replay within the camera, which is kind of a cool thing, but certainly not required. So let's take a look at a few examples. And these, again, are just examples. There are any number of cameras that will get this done, but just to give you an idea of ballpark. So a consumer camera might be the Panasonic HCV-180K, which costs about $230 and uses a mini HDMI connection. Um, this is probably the lowest tier camera that would be suitable for doing live sports. It's not made for this. It's not a professional grade camera, but at an entry level, it will get the job done. And it doesn't have to be a Panasonic. You know, JVC and uh, plenty of other manufacturers make cameras that are similar to this, that are kind of along the same specs. If you want to go a step up from that, um, I own this one myself uh, for personal use. This is a semi-pro camera, uh, the Panasonic HCV770K. That'll cost you about $600. It uses a micro HDMI connection for live output. Um, you'll get uh, stronger optical zoom with this camera. You'll get better light um, contrast, uh, better sensors, and it also has a mount for an external microphone if you want to attach um, sound. 
If you want to get into the pro level, um, this is what we have at Wakaiba. You have the Panasonic AGAC30. These will run you about twice as much as the Semi Pro model. They're $1,250. They use an HDMI connection. Um, they have external lighting. They have the ability to mount an external microphone on them. Multiple SD cards if you want to record with them at the same time. Um, you see they have the option there for the um, the shade, the visor that you can put over the camera if you're recording outdoors in a sunny environment that can help with glare that gets into the camera lens. And they also have the ability to use both a view screen or um, the traditional optical viewfinder. Um, so this would be a much higher end camera and you'll get results accordingly. Uh, and then if you want to talk about the opposite extreme, if you want to talk about the cameras that are used at the professional like major network television level, you could look at something like the Panasonic AJPX5 100GJ, which is $25,000, and that's not even including the extra lenses and external microphones and radio transmitter packs that you can get. That's just the base camera. But that is a true um, professional camera that is meant to be handheld. It, can, it has motion state stabilization on it. Um, it has every kind of connection you can imagine. You can output with SDI, HDMI, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, cellular. Um, it can send your, your live output wherever you want. This is a camera that is specifically made for broadcasting and even live broadcasting. But obviously that's well out of reach for most high schools and amateur programs. But just to give you an idea of what's out there. Again, at Wakaiva, we use the Panasonic AG AC30s. Um, those are what the broadcast production program has. They're great, versatile, all-around cameras that can be used for uh, any number of studio uses as well as uh, being perfectly appropriate for live sports. So video connection cables. Um, you got to think about this because this is going to depend on what kind of camera you have, what kind of video capture card you have, and how far away from your production rig your cameras are going to be located. So the most typical one that you may be familiar with home use and consumer use is USB, which comes in several different connector styles. A is the oldest classic one, USB-B, that's, you typically find that with printers. USB-C is much more common now. Um, if you have an Android phone, it probably charges with that if it's been made in the last couple of years. Um, some older ones are mini USB and micro USB. Um, these are not great for video content. They're actually data cables, not video cables, but you can send video as data over them. Um, some consumer grade cameras will use this. You can't go more than 15 feet with a standard cable, although if you do buy an active extension cable, you can technically extend USB up to 95 feet. So again, this is not ideal, but it does work and it also has the benefit of plugging directly into a computer. Very few cameras that are worth their salt will use this though. Uh, HDMI is the most common by far, certainly among consumer grade equipment. That stands for High Definition Multimedia Interface. It goes, you can send 4K or 1080p video output over those. The full size version is called HDMI A. You're probably used to connecting your big screen TV at home with that. Uh, there is also mini HDMI, which is also called HDMI B, and then an even smaller one called micro HDMI or HDMI C. Um, these are, again, consumer grade cables, but they're very high quality. Um, they're not really intended for professional use. They're, they're intended for connecting your home theater system in your living room. And as a result, they really don't go more than 20 to 65 feet, depending on the quality of cable you get. If you do anything 50 or higher, you're taking a chance and you better have a really strong quality cable and a really strong signal coming from your camera. Uh, remember that the, these are digital cables, so it's all or nothing. The signal either works or it doesn't. This is not like analog cables where it'll work and you'll just get a little static in it. Um, so you just have to be very careful with the length on these cables. SDI, Serial Digital Interface. Um, these are what the pros use. Um, you'll also hear these called BNC cables, although BNC technically is the name of the connector, not the cable. Um, but if you hear BNC cables, it means typically the same thing. Um, so it depends on the cable rating and the resolution, but generally you can get over 200 feet and certain varieties of these cables can even go over three or 400 feet without losing their signal. Um, and again, these are what the pros use and these are for much longer runs. 
Uh, and then finally, Ethernet. Um, again, like the USB, Ethernet is actually not a video cable, it's a data cable, but some cameras, particularly higher end cameras, are able to um, convert the video into data and send it over Cat5, Cat6, or Cat7 cable, uh, which uses an RJ45 jack. You can go about 328 feet with an Ethernet cable before you need to be running it through some kind of powered repeater because of signal loss. Um, and again, this just turns it, in, all it does is it turns it into data on your network. And then, you know, you've got an IP address that it's coming from and you can pull it over the network. Again, this would be pretty uncommon outside of the very most professional high-end cameras. Chances are you're going to be using the two in the middle, HDMI and SDI. Um, at Wakaiva, we rely mostly on SDI cable, although we do use HDMI conversion for some of the shorter runs because the cameras themselves output HDMI. So we get a little three-foot HDMI. HDMI cable, then run it through a converter, and then do the rest of the run with SDI. Um, I should point out, if you need to do a longer run with HDMI cable, you can get a powered repeater, um, or even a splitter. You don't actually have to split the signal with it. You can just use one input and one output on a splitter. That works too. Um, or like a switcher uh, that you would use like at home. Um, and as, soon, as long as it's powered, like you plug it into an AC outlet, it will um, capture the signal and boost it and repeat it. And then you get another fresh 20 to 65 feet that you can use. And you can daisy chain those together all day long. Um, it makes a little bit of a mess of your setup. But if you do need to do a longer run with HDMI cable, you can do it that way. So let's talk about video mixers and switchers. Now again, um, there's two different ways to do video mixing. You can do it with a physical piece of hardware where you plug all your cameras into the switcher and then you plug that switcher into the computer and then so the computer only sees it as one input and then you do the actual switching on the piece of hardware. Or you can skip the switcher entirely, or the mixer, um, and you can plug as many individual inputs as you want or as your video card supports. You can plug them directly into the computer and then you can use software to do the mixing. Um, either approach is acceptable, so this is kind of an optional component depending on your setup. The cheapest, um, basic, most basic one would be something like the Blackmagic AETM Mini which runs between three and five hundred dollars depending on whether you get the regular or the pro version. The biggest downside to this is that it doesn't have preview. So you're switching blind. You can't see the, the camera that you're going to switch to until you switch to it. Um, so that kind of limits your flexibility and kind of requires you to hold your breath and take a chance and hope that that camera is pointed where you want it to be and it's showing what you want it to be showing because you can't see what you're doing until it's already live. Um, but the nice thing about the Blackmagic AETM Mini is that it also functions as a video capture card. So you can get um, USB output out of this thing um, and you don't need a separate video capture card. So that's kind of a bonus. Um, but it has four HDMI inputs on it. Um, and the other thing is it lacks a physical fader, which in sports is not a big deal because very few people actually do fading. In sports, you typically do just straight up quick cuts between shots. Um, and again, none of this matters unless you're going to use more than one camera. If you're only going to use one camera, then obviously you don't need a mixer. But if you are going to use multi-camera, then you got to either have a hardware or a software mixing solution. If you want something more high-end, your pro-level choice here would be the Blackmagic AETM Television Studio Pro. That's going to run you about three grand. That does have a preview feature, um, so you can attach a monitor to that, which is of course not included in that price, but you would need a TV, some kind of television or monitor that you could attach for the preview output that will show you uh, what all of the inputs are currently looking at so that you can make intelligent decisions about what you're going to switch to. It does not function as a video capture card, so you would still need that in your production machine. Um, and it has eight inputs that are available in both SDI and HDMI options. And and it does have a physical fader on it so that you can uh, fade from one shot to another at whatever rate you want as you physically dial the bar. So now let's talk about those video capture cards. Um, unless you are using a camera that already functions as a capture card or a mixer that already functions as a capture card, you are going to need one of these. Contrary to popular belief, that HDMI port on the side of your laptop or on the back of your tower, that's only an output, it's not an input. Nothing will happen if you try to plug a camera into that. So you need a video capture device, which is almost never a standard feature on a stock computer. So 
the cheapest, easiest, and it's hard to believe that they make things this cheap. Um, you can go on Amazon and you can search for this and you can find a generic off-brand HDMI video capture. It looks like that. Um, and it's going to cost about $15 to $20, uh, which is a steal. Now, these are manufactured by no-name companies um, and they probably don't come with a warranty and they may not give you great results. I bought one of these just to see if you could really get good quality output from a $15 capture card. And the answer is yes, but you have to fiddle with it a little bit. The default YUI2 settings are a lower frame rate with higher quality, and it turns out the frame rate was so low that it resulted in really laggy video. I changed it to MJPEG, which gives you a higher frame rate, but at the cost of lower quality, and that was able to get me an acceptable output. Uh, the one thing I will caution you on with this, though, is that if you're thinking, oh, I'll just get four of these and I'll get a USB hub and then plug them into the computer. Yeah, you can't do that. You can't cheat with a USB hub because even USB 3.0 cable will not hold that much data. Um, you will have very poor results. Even if the capture cards that you're plugging into it are good quality, um, you can't send that much data over a USB signal. Uh, so these, these have got to plug directly into the computer. So if you've got a ton of USB uh, inputs on your computer and you want to buy a bunch of these things, that is one way to do it. Um, if you want something that's brand name that actually is going to have a warranty and a support department that you can call if it doesn't work right, um, the higher quality brand name equivalent of that would be the Elgato Camlink 4K. That's going to get you up to 4K resolution. Um, it is HDMI to USB and that's going to run you about $130. There are dozens of other USB sticks um, or even little cards that sit off to the side and then plug into your computer with a USB cable um, of varying brands. Avermedia makes a bunch of them. Uh, Elgato makes a bunch of them. Um, so, you know, shop around and, and see what you like. Uh, if you're going to use a tower then you could use something like the Blackmagic Decklink Duo 2. Um, that has four SDI inputs that go into a PCIe output. So this plugs directly into the motherboard, which will get you great performance. And that's why you can get four inputs um, into a single output. USB, you can't do that because USB won't hold enough data, but PCI will. Um, because it's a much faster technology and it interfaces directly with the motherboard. This runs about $495 and will get you up to 1080p. Blackmagic makes several variations on this card. Some of them have HDMI inputs, some of them have SDI inputs, some of them have other formats like VGA or DVI um, in various combinations and quantities. So take a look around on Blackmagic's website. There are other manufacturers who make similar cards as well. But this is the way to go if you want to have four inputs and not have a separate hardware mixer, uh, which is, you know, heavy and enormous and requires a separate operator. Um, if you want to do your mixing on the computer, this is the way to do it. And then uh, finally, another option would be something like the Innogeny Share 2. This is the only card I was able to find on the market that actually allows you to put to shove two inputs into the same card and then pipe that through USB into the computer. It has one HDMI input, one DVI input, although an adapter will easily make that a second HDMI or an SDI if you want. That costs $1,400, so you might look at that and say, well, if I'm going to do that, why don't I just get two of one of the cheaper ones um, and plug both of them in at the same time? And that's a very valid argument. The only reason that the Innogeny really adds value is if you're short on USB ports in the computer and you want to be able to get two inputs into the same USB. Um, but that's an option for you as well. Again, Wakaiva uses the Blackmagic Decklink Duo 2, and we've had really good results with that um, in combination with the SDI cable. And that is, again, a pretty reasonably priced option. All right, so stepping away from video, let's talk about audio inputs. Now, again, you might completely skip this section if you're not going to have an announcer. If you don't have announcers and you don't need to pipe music or other kinds of audio sources into your broadcast and you are satisfied to simply use the ambient audio that's coming in from the cameras, that's okay. And then you're done and you don't need to worry about audio inputs. But if you are looking for that higher professional quality broadcast and you do want to have announcers on it, chances are your announcers are not going to be sitting next to the camera. And even if they are, you don't want the quality of the crowd noise getting mixed in with your announcers. 
Um, so you're going to want separate input that you can control the levels on that. Um, you will get the best sound from a broadcast quality headset uh, for each of your announcers. They minimize picking up background audio you don't want, they don't take up space on the table, they don't require stands, and they keep your announcers hands free. They also provide for announcers uh, to monitor the sound coming out of the mixer so they can hear themselves and even each other in a noisy room, which cuts down on the tendency to accidentally talk over each other if you have more than one announcer. Uh, we started using these last year, particularly in light of the pandemic, because um, I was one of the announcers, Neil was the other announcer, we had to sit six feet apart from each other, which made it really hard to hear each other, but when you're using headsets, you get the your own audio plus the other announcer's audio in your ear, uh, which makes it much easier to hear. But if all you've got are handheld microphones, get yourself a cheap desktop stand so that at least the announcer doesn't have to pick up and hold the microphone for the whole game. Get you a cheap windscreen to reduce pops, winds, and background noise, and you're good to go. Aux audio, uh, music or sound effects can also be mixed in from phones, tablets, computers, or whatever. Just watch out for copyright issues, particularly if you're going to send your output to one of the major social media sites like YouTube or Facebook, uh, because they have automated detection algorithms that will scan your live stream and if it detects copyrighted music in your live stream they will shut you down and potentially smite you. Um, there can be consequences to your account and your continued ability to live stream if they catch you doing that. So uh, just be careful that you're only using royalty free music and sound effects because even if your venue has a mechanical license to play copyrighted music in the venue that does not extend to live streaming or to offering recorded on-demand broadcasts on the internet. Um, we have struggled with that at Wakaiva that even if I don't deliberately play music over the live stream, sometimes it the microphones pick up the stadium or the arena audio that's playing in the background. And even if it's poor quality at a low level, Sometimes YouTube will still catch it and then I get dinged and I lose my monetization and I have to go in and fix it after the fact and it's a huge pain. So I spend half my life trying to figure out how to make the headsets not capture the uh, ambient audio from the gymnasium or the stadium. Keep in mind the difference between mic and line level and between stereo and mono. So headsets and stick microphones are typically going to use mic level input whereas powered devices like phones and certain instruments and whatnot will typically use line level which is a much stronger signal so you need to make sure that your mixer is switched accordingly um, and also microphones are of course mono um, whereas uh, other inputs like phones and whatnot may be stereo and so make sure that you're using either a mono or a stereo cable accordingly and if you need help with that google is your friend and there are lots of articles and videos online to tell you the difference between ts and trs cable balanced and unbalanced cable etc so audio input devices um, you've got lots of choices here. Um, if you're just getting started and you're looking for something that's cheap but reasonably good quality, uh, I would suggest the Shure PGA 58. Um, I, I say PG stands for pretty good. Uh, it's about $54. It's a good quality broadcasting microphone. Um, obviously, it doesn't have an input, so you can't hear anything using this device. So it's one way only, but it outputs to a standard XLR cable. Um, if you are looking for the gold standard of stick microphones, that would be the Shure SM58. That's going to run you just under $100. Um, also uses an XLR. Um, also pay attention when you're buying one of these. They come in switched and unswitched varieties. Um, if you're going to do sports broadcasting as opposed to like a singer on a stage, you may want the switched variety so that if your announcer needs to cough or whatever uh, or have a side conversation that they can flip their microphone off without having to go to the mixer. Um, so just pay attention to that because they come in both hypes and it doesn't usually change the price. Uh, but the SM58 is kind of the gold standard um, for concert halls and sports venues worldwide. Um, there are certainly, I mean, Sennheiser makes some great microphones as well, but the Shure SM58 is kind of the microphone everybody goes to. Uh, if you're going to look at headsets, which again I recommend for announcers, 
Um, obviously, this doesn't work as well for like interviewing coaches, but uh, if you are going to have announcers, the headset is certainly easier as a hands-free option and gives you better quality because it keeps that microphone a consistent distance from the announcer's mouth, so you don't have to worry about the sound getting louder and softer as the announcer cranes his head to see what's going on in the play and pulls away from the microphone a little bit. You don't have to worry about that. You also get the benefit of hear-through. Um, there's the Audio Technica BPHS2, um, which is dual ear, or 2S, which is single ear. Um, I like the single ear ones because then I can hear the officials and I can hear what else is going on in the sound around the arena um, instead of having both of my ears covered. Um, this is $329. There are cheaper and more expensive ones out there, uh, but that's going to give you a quarter inch mono input for the headphone and an XLR output for the microphone that all goes into the same cable. The other thing I like about that one is that it comes with the cable that you need that is compatible with most common mixers. Uh, if you want to go ultra pro, if you want to go with what the ESPN people use um, and what professional broadcasters use, that'd be the current generation of that is the Sennheiser 27. That's going to run you $500 to $650 each, plus there's an $80 cable that you need to buy that is sold separately. Um, you can get that cable in an unterminated version, which means that you're going to solder your own connections onto it based on your own hardware, or you can get one that already has the right tip soldered onto it if you want to use the, the typical, which would be a quarter inch mono input and XLR output that would go into most typical mixers. Uh, again, at Wakaiva, we use the Audio Technica BPHS 2S. Uh, and we've had great results with that. Audio mixers. Again, you know, like everything else I'm showing you, I'm giving you three or four representative examples, but there are dozens, if not hundreds, to choose from at all different price points. Um, so feel free to do your own research. Uh, at the very, very lowest end, um, your semi-pro option here would be something like the Pile Pad 22 MX UBT, which is just under $50. That's going to give you two microphone inputs that are XLR, and then it'll give you a quarter-inch mono left-right and quarter-inch stereo phones to get your audio mix out to your production machine and also to get your audio mix back into the ear of your headset. That's about the least you're going to spend on a mixer, and that's a very, very small mixer. Um, it, it barely is the size of your hand. Uh, if you want to go to a pro level mixer, it's still pretty cheap. Uh, you could look at something like the Mackie Mix 8. That's going to run you about $89. It has two XLR microphone inputs plus two quarter inch stereo inputs if you want to attach music devices or uh, sound effects. Uh, it's going to have your quarter inch mono left right uh, outputs to go into your uh, main stream. You're going to have quarter inch stereo phones and you also will get quarter inch aux and control room outputs which is nice if you want to use the same mixer to drive the live audio that's on over the public address system and you want to have separate control over the levels on that versus the levels that are going into your uh, live stream. Uh, having those aux outputs is kind of an extra bonus. Uh, then another pro option that's a little bit more is the Mackie 802 VLZ4. Um, that's about $200, and this is what we use at Wakaiva. Uh, it's got three XLR inputs plus eight stereo quarter inch inputs, and then again it has those same outputs uh, to go to your production live stream as well as going to out to your headphones to get return audio to your announcers. Each input has its own separate control for aux. So you can say, for example, that my microphone, because I'm functioning as both the PA announcer and as the play-by-play -play announcer for the live stream, my microphone is going to go to both the live stream and the PA system. But I can separately turn that off when I want to talk on the live stream without talking on the PA system. Um, all I have to do is dial the knob down and I can do that. Meanwhile, my other announcer um, only talks on the live stream, never talks on the PA system. So I just keep his aux volume turned down all the way. And the music that I play, I only want that to go to to the PA system. I never want that to go on the live stream. So I keep its aux volume up and its main volume down so that it only plays through that. So that's something you can do with this Mackie. Um, and again, 
Mackey's not the only manufacturer that makes stuff like this. There are plenty of other brands as well. But if you're spending more than about $200 on a mixer, that's frankly overkill. Unless you've got, you know, a dozen shotgun microphones that you're using to pick up coaches and huddles and noise from the field and the and the, and the court. If you're going to have a bunch of shotgun microphones or something like that, then maybe you need a bigger mixer that has more inputs or has digital effects. One other thing I'll mention about mixers is phantom power. Uh, typical announcing microphones like stick microphones and headset microphones don't need phantom power, so it really doesn't matter whether your mixer supports that or not. The only reason that would matter to you is if you're going to use that mixer to pick up maybe pre-game or halftime performances, maybe from a, a choir singing the national anthem or the cheerleading squad or something like that, and you want to use condenser mics like those, boom, those little boom microphones that, that go high up in the air um, that capture sound from all around them, those condenser mics typically do require phantom power, so you would want a mixer that supports that, which that Mackie that I showed you there, it does. All right, enough about audio. Let's talk about graphic data inputs. So this is where um, even for people who have a lot of AV experience tend to get lost because this is a unique need for sports broadcasting. Um, and it's not as well understood outside of the professional level are some great new options that allow anybody, even on a somewhat limited budget, to do this kind of stuff. So one option is the BoxCast Scoreboard Assist. Now that's free, but free comes with a very big asterisk next to it. Um, the good news is it's compatible with most scoreboard brands. The downside is it only works with BoxCast. Um, so if you're using any system other than BoxCast, uh, this isn't going to help you. And if you're going to do that, uh, it requires a BoxCast subscription. And the lowest BoxCast subscription that supports this is $249 a month, including the add-on that you need in order to use scoreboard data. So it's free, except that it isn't. Uh, if you need more than one of these units, because you need multiple venues, then they're about $600 each to get extras. Next up, we have a couple of different products from SportsCast, which are compatible with most popular scoreboard brands. The first one is the ScoreLink, which connects to your scoreboard controller with a cable they provide, and then uses a USB or Ethernet connection to provide data in a few different ways. You can have it deposit the data into an XML file every tenth of a second with the device alone, and then it's up to you to design graphics and slot the data from that file into them. In a minute, I'll get into software for your broadcast machine that can help with that, either bundled with your streaming software or as a separate product. This is a very powerful and highly customizable way to do it, but it also requires a somewhat above average comfort level with technical configuration. Or, with a subscription to their service, you can have the ScoreLink send the data to the internet and then use their Sports Suite graphics system to create inputs you can pull into your broadcast software. And that's a little bit more turnkey. There's also a more sophisticated device called the Score Hub, which is actually a whole independent PC inside a little box with a touchscreen to change the settings. This one doesn't connect directly to your broadcast computer. Instead, it can send data over the local network or internet like its ScoreLink cousin, or it can generate graphics within the box and output them over HDMI or NDI. Besides Ethernet, the Score Hub also has built-in Wi-Fi if it's more convenient for you to connect it to the internet that way. It also has the option to receive data wirelessly from certain scoreboard controllers, or you can still use a traditional cable if yours isn't compatible. You can find these devices on B&H Photo Video for $700 and $1,000 respectively, but that's the sticker price if you just want to buy it from a reseller who is likely already in your approved vendor catalog without talking to a person. You'll get a box delivered to you, but then you may very well be mystified about what exactly you're supposed to do with it. So, if you want to go the SportsCast route, I'd strongly suggest giving them a call or filling out their contact form at sportscast.net. And note that that's spelled with a Z. They're a local company out of Winter Springs here in Florida, and I've met several of their staff members, including their president, Mike, and they're all super helpful and can hook you up with the right combination of hardware and services that will do what you want within your budget. And they'll teach you how to use it. Just tell them Mark from Wakaiva sent you. 
Then there are the more traditional players in this space. Um, Dactronics has been doing this for a long time. There is a product called the Dactronics All Sport CG. CG stands for Character Generator. That's going to run you a thousand dollars. It is compatible only with Dactronics scoreboards, and this one works a little differently. It independently creates the graphics and the overlays, and it burns them into your video feed. So you actually put this device between your camera or mixer output and the computer and it burns the graphics into the video image and then sends them to the computer. That obviously reduces your flexibility. First of all, you can't control what the graphics look like. You also can't control when they appear and disappear um, because they're permanently burned into the feed. So that is an option. Um, frankly, this tends to be used more by coaches who are trying to burn data into like their, their game film for reviewing later more than it is for fans. Uh, and then if you really want to do what the pros do, um, there's the Dactronics Livebook GFX. That's going to start at $9,000 and goes up to $17,000, depending on how many sports you authorize it for. It is compatible only with Dactronics, and this thing is a beast. It's a 12-pound computer with its own display that generates customizable graphics and then outputs those graphics over NDI or SDI. You get full control over what they look like, uh, but this assumes that you have a separate person operating your graphics using a separate machine uh, that is not integrated with the rest of your system. But uh, obviously this is very expensive and is specifically for Dactronics, but that is the highest end option that you have. At Wakaiva, we use the SportsCast score we actually have a score hub as well that we use sometimes when we, especially if I need to connect two scoreboards at once, like when we do wrestling on two mats. Um, but we find that this meets our needs really well because then we just take the graphics that we've already designed and pipe the data into them. Um, and it's the simplest and most reliable way to do it. So let's get into the choices for your production hardware, which will be responsible for encoding and streaming the final output of all of your sources after they're mixed together. Now, with some fully integrated solutions like BoxCast or TriCaster, your production hardware might not be a PC or a Mac in the traditional sense at all. You can get hardware that is specifically made for encoding, but that tends to be more expensive than getting a more versatile computer. So for the purposes of this discussion, we'll assume you're looking for a computer. Now, as I mentioned before, there's no rule that it has to be just one computer. Professional setups often have dedicated machines for mixing video, building graphics, handling instant replay, and encoding the final product. But for the examples in this presentation, we'll assume that you're using a single computer to accomplish all of the mixing and encoding. So the first choice you have to make is whether you want to use a laptop or a tower. Laptops are obviously more portable, and it's more likely that you may have one laying around that you can use instead of buying something new. Uh, laptops used to be more expensive than similarly powered desktops, but that's not really true anymore. As a matter of fact, laptops can sometimes be cheaper now than towers with equal specs because manufacturers sell them at higher volume. But there is a trade-off for using laptops. Uh, first of all, your options for adding non-standard hardware to expand their capabilities, like a video capture card for instance, is going to be limited. You're going to be stuck with USB. Most consumer grade laptops also have limited video output options. We'll get to software in a minute, but whatever software you pick, check its recommended system requirements, especially whether it runs on a PC, a Mac, or both. For what it's worth, Chromebooks are probably not going to cut it here. So let's talk about laptops first. Um, Mid-range consumer laptop is probably, again, about the, as low as you go. If you go any lower than this, you're going to have performance problems. Um, HP Pavilion 15T uh, will run you about 600 bucks. runs on an Intel Core i7 with Iris Xe graphics, 8 gigabytes of RAM, and a 256 gigabyte solid state drive. Solid state drives are great, especially if you're going to record using the computer at the same time, because they're much faster than regular hard drives. Um, also, if you're going to be sourcing video input files like for pre-roll or post-roll video, um, those are great to have on an SSD because they will load faster that way. Um, they, again, the, the examples I'm giving you here are HPs, just so that I'm doing apples to apples, but you know, Dell, Lenovo, whatever brand you want to use, they all have kind of similar profiles to this. It doesn't have to be this specific model. Um, as it just has to be kind of similar specs, and that's going to, again, be driven by the software that you're going to run on it. Check the system requirements. If you want to go high-end, 
Uh, pretty much the best you can do in this space is going to be something similar to the HP ZBook Studio G7 workstation. This is a creator's laptop, uh, a professional creator's laptop. Um, gaming laptops also are good at this kind of stuff because the same things that make the computer good at running video games also make it good at doing broadcast production. Uh, the G7 is going to run you a little north of $2,500, but it has a mega powerful graphics card in it. It's got an NVIDIA Quadra T2000 with four gigabytes of dedicated video memory in it. Uh, it also has twice as much RAM and twice as big of a solid state drive. All these computers are customizable as well if you want to get a bigger hard drive or a better graphics card or more memory. Memory. Most of them you can go into the, the vendor's website and you can soup them up or you can dial down options and tweak them so that you get the things that are important to you. Uh, let me give you a couple of options if you want a tower. So a mid-range consumer tower would be something like the HP Envy Desktop TE01. Um, that's going to run you just below $1,000, has similar specs to the laptop. Uh, again, important that you have that dedicated graphics card. You don't want to buy a computer that doesn't have dedicated graphics. If you buy a computer that uses integrated graphics on the motherboard, that's usually not very powerful, doesn't have its own graphics memory, and is going to cause lag on your video. Um, this particular model has 8 gigabytes of memory, which is about right for this application. You don't want to go much less than that, and it has a 256 gigabyte solid state drive if you get the standard default configuration from HP's website without customizing it. Uh, professional tower. So if you want to get a tower, but you want to go high end, and again, if you are going to get a tower, be careful about getting small form factor ones or the little, the little tiny footprint ones, because then you're not going to be able to put a video capture card inside them. You want a computer that you can actually take the, take the panel off the back of it and plug in um, an extra component, like a video capture card. Professional tower. Um, the example I'm using here is the HP Z6 G4 workstation, which will run you about $2,300, so kind of on par with the high end laptop I showed you. That's going to run an Intel Xeon processor with an AMD Radeon Pro WX3200, which again, just like the NVIDIA, has 4 gigabytes of dedicated graphics DDR memory, um, 8 gigabytes of memory, and then a 256 gig solid state drive plus a 500 gigabyte traditional hard drive. So um, that'll get you pretty far with broadcasting as well. Again, there are computers that are better or worse than any of these and everything in between. We found at Wakaiva that the district does not allow procuring computers, except by ordering one of the pre-approved basic models through their IT department. That wasn't going to do it for us, so we found a loophole that while you can't buy computers using school funds, um, you absolutely can buy computer parts from an approved vendor, which included BNH Photo Video. So we just built our own tower that's uh, pretty comparable or maybe a little bit better than the Envy example on the screen, but has pretty similar parts to what you'd find in this HP Envy. And we spent about $1,250 on that for all the parts putting it together. So now that you have your hardware, you have to figure out what software you're going to run on this. And this is going to be RTMP software, Real-Time Messaging Protocol. That is the standard that YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, all of the above, wherever you're going to send it on the internet, um, RTMP is the protocol that you're going to use. So you need software that is going to mix together all of your video and audio inputs, which again may be partially pre-mixed by hardware um, or may not be, and you may be doing the mixing on the computer itself. Also, your graphics data input and whatnot is going to mix all that together and code it into MP4 format or H.264 format if you prefer, um, and then send that over RTMP out to the internet. So, several choices here. Probably the most popular is called OBS, which is short for Open Broadcaster Software. This is an open source community program. So, if you're familiar with maybe using GIMP instead of Photoshop, uh, to do graphics editing, or maybe you use Audacity instead of Audition to do uh, free sound editing. This is kind of the equivalent of that. It's an open source community project. It's free. It's basic no frills RTMP streaming, unlimited sources and overlays. It can do up to 4K, although again, good luck actually broadcasting in 4K in any kind of meaningful way. 
The catch here is that it has pretty limited support for live data, unless you want to go around either writing your own plugin or searching the internet trying to find plugins. You can add text-based sources, but getting scoreboard data into OBS is tricky. And the other thing is, because it's an open source community project, if you need support or help, there is really no one you can call. You're going to be stuck with online message boards. Uh, if you want to go a step up from that, we have vMix. Um, the nice thing about vMix is that it's available in several different tiers, uh, including a free one. They got a 60-day trial, um, and then it reverts into kind of a minimally functional system. Um, the basic HD one is only 60 bucks, and that's a steal. Uh, now, the basic version will only handle four inputs and one overlay, but that may very well be enough for you, especially if you're just getting started. Uh, they have a better version that offers unlimited inputs for $350 and outputs in high definition and also supports callers. If you want to have a, a call in, um, maybe a guest commentator or another guest interview, or um, maybe you want to interview a sponsor at halftime or something like that, you can have call in. Um, and then uh, if you can even go to the higher versions for 700 bucks, you can get the 4K version, which obviously outputs in 4K and also adds instant replay support. Um, and then they have a pro version that's $1,200 that is the works. Um, if $1,200 is a lot for you to bite off and chew, then they also have a subscription model where you pay $50 a month and it gives you all of the same features as the pro version. Uh, Wirecast is also a very common uh, and well-reviewed option. Um, they cost uh, $600 for the studio version or $800 for the pro version, but you're probably going to need the pro version because only the pro version supports scoreboards and replay. Um, replay is kind of optional, scoreboards are kind of important, uh, but it does offer unlimited sources and overlays and up to 4K. Um, and the catch here is that if you want custom titles and live scoreboard data, you're going to have to get separate software for that. And if you get the new blue titler software for sports, that's going to run you another $600. Now, that software will run circles around the software that comes with vMix. It's very powerful. But just be aware that you kind of have a chain reaction here that you, you're going to pay 800 bucks for Wirecast, and then you're going to pay another 600 bucks for your titling software uh, because it's made by a third party. Um, their XSplit is another popular thing that uh, people will broadcast with. Um, up to four sources in the free version, unlimited in pro, goes up to 4K. Um, you're, uh, this one gets a little tricky with getting scoreboard data into it because it's not really made for that. Um, so you're going to have to write some custom script if you want to get your scoreboard data into the software. Um, so if you have a software engineering background, great. If not, this may be difficult, but it is free. Um, or if you need the pro version, it's between $5 and $15 a month, depending on how much money you're willing to put up uh, at, up front. Or you can buy it forever for $200 instead of the monthly subscription fee. Uh, Boxcast is one of the bigger names in doing this. Boxcast is really more of a service than it is a, a, a simple software product because you're buying into their whole ecosystem. So that's $249 a month. Um, they offer other plans, but $249 is the least that you're going to pay if you actually want to be able to do live sports and need all the features that are necessary to do that. Um, the catch here is that this actually doesn't include in the actual encoder. Um, you're either going to have to buy their standard encoder, which is $400 and offers one input, or their pro encoder, which is $3,500 and includes two inputs and outputs at 4K. Or you can use one of the above, OBS, VMix, Wirecast, etc., um, with Boxcast as the service that you send it to, and then they handle your graphics, and they also handle distributing it to YouTube or twitch or wherever you're going to send it um so again boxcast really more of a service than it is a software product but since it is one of the bigger names in this it's worth mentioning and this again like every other list of examples i've shown you in this presentation is not comprehensive or exhaustive it's just to give you a sampling of some of the more popular choices at various price points at Wakaiva, we use vMix. We actually have the, we started with the $60 basic HD version, and then last year we upgraded to the $350 HD version. Nice thing about vMix is they will give you credit for what you already bought. So if you buy the $60 version and you want to go to the $350, they'll give you that $60 credit toward the $350 when you're ready to upgrade. Um, you only pay for the features that you need, and it comes with graphics capability. Uh, it comes with a free 
title designer or graphics designer that's built into it. It also comes with a ton of graphics that are already pre-programmed into vMix. Um, so, and they're actually pretty good. If you don't care about custom branding or you don't want to design your own graphics, they have a ton of scoreboard graphics that come out of the box with it. And they can be operated either manually or with the automatic input. So you can type the score by hand. There is a clock feature within vMix that you can use to keep it, like especially for an easier sport like soccer where you just kind of start the clock and let it go, that you can run the clock within vMix without connecting anything to it. Or you can connect that data to it and vMix has, without having to buy any other add-on packs, will connect to that just the way it comes. If you want to design your own graphics, it comes with a basic graphic designer. No, it's not as powerful as the one that you can buy separately for Wirecast, but it, again, it's it's free with the $350 purchase. You don't have to spend another $600 to get that. Um, so vMix for us was the best combination of all the features we needed for a very reasonable price point. One catch though, vMix is PC only. You can run it on a Mac, but you would need to run it on emulation software. All right, so the final component of our little chart here, network and internet. So you, once you have this great encoded live stream, you've got to send it somewhere. Um, so network and internet considerations. Uh, Ethernet obviously is preferable. It's faster data speeds, it's more reliable, but obviously it's not practical at all venues. Um, you may have no choice but to locate your broadcast rig somewhere where it can't reach an Ethernet port. Um, especially if you're out at a high school baseball or softball stadium, there's probably no Ethernet anywhere in sight. But if you can, if you have Ethernet available, that's the best way to go. Wi-Fi may work great when you go into an empty gym or an empty stadium and test it out before the season begins and you think, wow, this is great, this is perfect, I love it. And then you fill your arena or your stadium with fans, um, particularly students who already have their phones configured to auto-connect to the school's Wi-Fi. Um, and then they walk in and you suddenly have 500 or 1,000 people connected to the same Wi-Fi router that your broadcasting rig is connected to and it doesn't work anymore. Or it works, but you, the, the quality is terrible and it keeps cutting out and keeps buffering. Um, so just be careful with that. Uh, professional arenas, um, they will usually have a separate Wi-Fi network that's for their actual production people that's separated from the guest network so that it doesn't get too congested. But obviously at a high school or an amateur venue, you're not going to have that luxury. You're gonna be on the same Wi-Fi network as everybody else. So just be careful about that. Uh, then as the option of last resort, you can pull out your cell phone and either USB tether it or make a hotspot and use 4G or 5G cellular data. Uh, just be aware that a two hour broadcast at 1080p to a single destination is gonna burn through about four gigabytes of data. So hope your plan can handle that. Um, and also hope your, your signal strength is good because some high school gyms work like a Faraday cage and uh, no signal gets in, no signal gets out. These things determine how much bandwidth you use, um, how many concurrent destinations, including backups. Um, also your video resolution, um, 4K will chew up a massive amount of bandwidth, uh, 1080p less, 720p even less than that. Um, your audio bit rate, you use 128K, that's what most people recommend. Um, but your audio bit rate will also affect your bandwidth and then whether you choose to monitor your own broadcast or not. So then, where will you send your broadcast? What platform do you want to use? Uh, well, the probably the number one name in this is YouTube. Um, YouTube is great, first of all, because it's ubiquitous. Everybody has the YouTube app. Um, virtually any smart TV made since about 2012 has the YouTube app built into it so they can watch on the big screen. Um, almost everybody has a Google account and knows YouTube and knows how to sign into it and knows how to use it. Um, so it's a very robust infrastructure. Uh, the other thing that is beneficial about YouTube is that it's free. Um, that you're, it doesn't cost your viewers anything. 
or they could choose to watch ad-free for $12 a month if they want to subscribe to YouTube Premium. A common misconception about YouTube is that you have to meet these lofty subscriber and watch time requirements in order to live stream or post videos. That's not true. Anybody can make a channel and start posting videos. Where you need the thousand subscribers is to monetize them, so you just won't be able to make any money off of YouTube until you hit that thousand subscribers, and you also won't be able to live stream directly from a mobile device, which is not what we're talking about here anyway, but you can absolutely live stream before you hit those thresholds. It is up to you once you get to the thousand subscriber threshold and you're able to become a YouTube partner. It is up to you if you want to make your videos available for free or whether you want to put them behind a membership paywall and uh, require people to become a member of your channel uh, and at a price that you set in order to uh, watch, in which case obviously YouTube will take a commission on that. As for monetization on YouTube, you become eligible for that once you have a thousand or more subscribers and more than 4,000 valid public watch hours in the last 12 months. At that point, you become eligible to join the YouTube Partner Program. You'll get a share of the advertising revenue from ads that run next to your broadcasts, and you'll also get, uh, for anybody who watches ad-free, you'll get a cut of their premium subscriptions. In the interest of managing expectations, you should know that this is probably not going to be life-changing money. For most high school and amateur programs who have dozens to hundreds of views per video, I think Wakaiva made about $200 last year on YouTube monetization. Another nice thing about YouTube though is that you can choose where the ad breaks land. There's a button that you can push in your live control room to make sure that the advertisements appear at appropriate points like timeouts and halftime, but you still have to provide content because not everyone is guaranteed to get an ad. Just be aware you are not allowed to burn in your own advertising on YouTube. So if you have sponsors and they send you mid-roll video, you're not allowed to do that. If YouTube catches you doing that, they'll terminate your channel because that competes with their own advertising. Now, you can do sponsorships. You can absolutely uh, read sponsored content. You can mention your, your advertisers and your sponsors all you want. Uh, you just can't burn their advertising into the video. Um, that will get you into trouble. And you can, you can also, again, choose videos to require membership if you want. Uh, and again, YouTube will police, and they are very, very good at policing copyrighted music in your broadcast, and you will instantly lose your monetization if they catch even 10 seconds of garbled audio in the background of a commercial recording. So just be careful about that. One last thing I'll mention about YouTube is that they offer really superior analytics, probably better analytics than any other social platform or live streaming platform. If you really want to get insight into who's watching your videos, where they are, what their demographics are, which videos are performing the best, how they're getting to your channel, whether it's through an external website or a web search or through the YouTube app or through a smart TV or whatever, um, you can really dig into dashboards in YouTube and begin become a better broadcaster from learning from that research. Facebook is another place that people like to send live streams. Um, it is free. Uh, you have the option to put an event paywall, which Facebook did a little demo with that last year where they started offering it with no commissions. Uh, that will eventually change where they will start taking a commission um, from your ticket sales, but you can sell tickets to your Facebook event. There is no follower requirement, so that's the nice thing about Facebook is you don't need a thousand followers or subscribers before you can start doing this, and you set the price per event as opposed to YouTube where it's a membership model. You don't charge per video, you charge per month, essentially. Uh, Twitter. Twitter is, is tricky with this. Um, Twitter for a long time didn't offer a live streaming option and then they bought Periscope and they used Periscope as the live streaming option. So you're actually live streaming to Periscope and then Periscope in turn will auto share it to Twitter. The quality I found is not that great. First of all, people don't go to Twitter to watch two hour sporting events. They go to Twitter to watch 15 second videos. The other problem with Twitter is that 
they're in the process of changing their API. They've, they've recently shut down Periscope. The Periscope API still works for live streaming, but they need to get it going um, for actual Twitter. So it remains to be seen whether Twitter is eventually going to become a real destination for live streaming. I don't ever put entire events on Twitter, but I do occasionally put highlights um, or interviews or like game breaks if we do like a halftime update or something like that. I put that kind of stuff on Twitter, but I usually don't put whole games on Twitter. It's just not a great source for that. The other thing is there's no monetization on Twitter. You can't make any money off of doing live streaming on Twitter. Uh, Twitch is kind of up and coming in this space. Uh, Twitch is most famous for video game live streaming, but it has really expanded beyond that. They have a partnership with Amazon now, and they've, they, like I said, have really started to branch out beyond video gaming. They're maybe not as much of a household name as some of these others, and they don't have as much penetration as far as everybody having the app or having an app on smart TVs. But but it is uh, certainly an option. Um, you have to have 500 minutes broadcast, seven unique broadcast days, three concurrent viewers, and 50 followers before you can join their partner program and actually start monetizing. Once you do start monetizing, you decide what the viewer pays or if the viewer pays. Uh, and then, of course, I have to mention NFHS Network. NFHS Network is the official partner of the Florida High School Athletic Association, which is where we are, and they also have partnerships with a lot of other athletic associations. Um, this is the only service that you're allowed to use, at least in Florida, for postseason games, unless you want to pay royalties. In Florida, for regular season games, the host school owns the rights to their own broadcast, and they can do whatever they want with it. For postseason games, the association owns the rights to the broadcast, and if you want to broadcast it anywhere, you have to pay for those rights just like you were a TV station. Uh, you pay the same price that a TV station would pay, which can get very expensive. But because they have a partnership with NFHS Network, you can broadcast on the NFHS Network for free, even in postseason. Your viewers, though, for your viewers, it is not free. There is no free model for that. They have to pay $11 a month or $70 a year, but you get a royalty from those subscription fees. So uh, we actually make decent money off of this. We make more money off of NFHS than we do off of YouTube, even though we have far fewer people who watch there. So when you're deciding where you're going to send your broadcast what you really have to think about is what is what is your objective is your objective to generate revenue um, if so you want to look at something like NFHS network or YouTube memberships or Facebook paid events if you don't care as much about revenue and you're just looking for reach and accessibility and getting the most number of eyeballs you can YouTube without the paywall is probably your best bet Facebook is is maybe a close second to that um, the only reason that YouTube is maybe be better is just because it's more ubiquitous than Facebook is, which Facebook, you only reach people who are members of Facebook. And you can send to more than one. Just, you know, watch your bandwidth. And there are providers like a service called Restream, where you can send your stream to them and then they will redistribute it to more than one of these in combination with others. Now that's not free, but you can subscribe to something like that. Uh, you may be wondering, where's Instagram? Why is Instagram not on this chart? And that is because Instagram, while they do support live video, they only support it from a mobile device device. So if you want to pull out your phone and point it at the action and live stream on Instagram, you can do that, but you cannot use it in an actual professional rig like this where you're doing it from a computer over RTMP, at least not without some pretty serious hacks. So what happens when you put all of this together and how much is the bottom line? So let's first take a look at the bare bones. What is the least you can do to get a professional quality or at least semi-pro quality setup. Um, so taking the least expensive camera that I proposed earlier, which is about $230, don't forget a tripod, which I didn't mention before, but you obviously don't want to use a handheld camera for this or your viewers are going to get seasick. Um, and the other thing is you will find $20 tripods on Amazon don't get those. Um, those are made for still cameras and they, when you try to pan them back and forth, they will be jerky and noisy. Uh, I've learned that the hard way. You want a tripod that is called a fluid head tripod. This allows the tripod to move smoothly when you're panning it and it is made for motion video cameras as opposed to still cameras. Uh, the cheapest one you're going to find is about $75. Uh, you're going to need, let's assume you're going to use HDMI, so you'll need a 20-foot HDMI extension cable that will attach to the cable that comes with the camera. That'll run you about 17 bucks. 
Uh, then we're going to use the cheapest possible generic off-brand HDMI capture stick. Again, if you have problems with it being laggy, try changing your input mode to MJPG and you may have better results. That's going to cost you about 15 bucks. Now let's look at the audio side. Let's get the cheapest microphone that's any good. That'd be the Shure PGA 58. That's going to be $54. You're going to need a short XLR cable, which will be about 4 bucks to connect that to a mixer. Um, cheapest mixer I can get you is going to be about $47. Then you're going to need a breakout cable to connect that mixer to the computer. That's going to cost you about $9. Uh, and then let's assume that you're going to get the, the least expensive laptop that meets the requirements for doing this without you know, getting bogged down. That's going to be about $600 for uh, an HP Pavilion or similar laptop. Let's assume you're going to use the free version of OBS and we're not going to worry about scoreboards um, for the moment. Um, again, OBS has a basic clock function in it if you want to put a clock function on the screen. And if you want to do a text input for actually putting the score on the screen and just update it manually, you can do that. So we won't worry about scoreboard integrations for this example. Your grand total comes to just over $1,000. Obviously, the two biggest hitters in that are the computer and the camera, which you may have laying around. And so maybe if you have uh, something that you already own that meets the requirements, maybe you don't have to buy those components. And in that case, the rest of it really doesn't add up to much because that's $830 out of 1000 The rest of it's not bad. The other thing you could do if you want to make this even simpler, you could get rid of the microphone, the XLR cable, the mixer, and the breakout cable, replace that whole setup with a $20 USB headset. Um, or maybe you just don't have an announcer and you don't bother with the audio at all. You just take the audio from the camera. That'll save you $90 to $100 um, if you want to get rid of the audio setup. But if you are going to have an announcer, I really think it's worth the $94 to get a decent microphone that runs through a mixer because you'll just get so much better results with that. All right, so now let's look at Wakaiva set. This is what we're using today as of the beginning of the 2021 school year. Um, and this is serving us pretty well. This is not where we started. We worked our way up to this and we may yet work our way to even better things as time goes on, but this is doing pretty well for us. So we have Panasonic AGAC 30 cameras. Those are $1,250 each and we use up to four of them. We don't necessarily use four at every broadcast, but we have up to four that we can use. Um, a heavy duty fluid head tripod. Um, so this is the same as the tripod I showed you earlier, except it's heavier duty to handle that heavier camera. Obviously this is not to scale. The tripod is much bigger than that. Um, that runs about 130 bucks. Need one of those for each camera. Then we're gonna have to, because this camera does not support SDI, but we need to run longer cables. We're gonna use a little tiny three foot HDMI cable to connect it to a converter box that runs about $60 each, and that's gonna convert the signal from HDMI to SDI. That's gonna now allow us to go 100 feet with it. So now we're gonna take some SDI cable. We tend to use two cameras that use 50 foot cables for the shorter runs, and then we use two cameras that are 100 feet for the longer runs. Um, and then that all plugs into the Blackmagic DeckLink Duo 2, which is 500 bucks. Now we move to the audio side of things. We have two announcers, so we have two Audio-Technica VPHS 2S headsets that are $329 each. You're going to need a splitter for those so that both headsets can get the, um, the audio output and hear each other. Um, we're also going to get an iPad. Uh, that current generation will run you about $330. We use that for sound effects and music. That's going to need a breakout cable to get into the mixer. And there's that Mackie 802 VLZ4 mixer that's $200 we showed you earlier. So the iPad and the headsets plug into that. Then we have a 10 foot quarter inch TS to XLR cable that will run to the PA system. This is going to plug into the aux port on the mixer so that we can control some but not all of the audio that's going into that mixer coming out through the PA system. Then we're going to take a, a six foot double XLR to eighth inch TRS cable. That'll run you about $13 on Amazon. And that's going to get the mixer into the computer. Um, now we've got the uh, All Sport 5000. That's what we use at Wakaiva. For what it's worth, that's $1,250, but I'm not going to count that in the total because that's usually not the broadcast producer's responsibility. That's something your venue should already have. Um, we're going to connect that through a score link that costs about $700. 
We're going to put that all of this into the custom tower that we built. Again, that's similar to that HP Envy model that I showed you, but we built our own. The custom tower as we built it was $1,125 for all the parts inside. So we take the Blackmagic Decklink Duo, we put it inside that, we connect the mixer to that, we connect the score link to that, and then we put the vMix software, vMix HD software at $350. We install that on the computer. Now the thing about using a tower as opposed to a laptop is there are certain things you take for granted that are built into a laptop that are usually not built into a tower. First of all, Wi-Fi. If you don't have the luxury of using Ethernet, you're going to need an antenna, and that's only about $17. You can get that. That adds Wi-Fi to a tower that didn't already have it if you need it. Of course, a keyboard and a mouse, that would be built into a laptop or at least a trackpad. If you use a tower, you're going to need a separate keyboard and mouse. Good quality one will get you about $35. Besides that, you also are going to need to see what you're doing. A laptop would have a built-in display, but a tower is going to need a monitor, a portable one, it's 15 inches will cost you about $150 those portable ones are nice because they will fold up and they travel really well and your grand total for everything on the screen here is just north of $10,000 which may be a scary number at first but keep in mind that the cameras are accounting for half of that so if you already have cameras or you don't need four of them then that total comes down pretty dramatically. We didn't buy those cameras specifically for live streaming. That was part of the school's equipment with their broadcast production program. Um, so we, it's not like we went out and spent $10,000 to start live streaming. We took advantage of the equipment that we already had from the broadcast production program um, and then augmented it with the headset and the black magic card and the computer rig and the score link and, you know, and et cetera. So, um, it may not actually be a $10,000 investment, but for what it's worth, what I've put on the screen here is worth about $10,000. Let's talk about camera positioning. Um, so now that you have all these, all this great equipment, where do you put it and what do you do with it? Um, so first thing I want to talk about is the 180 degree rule. So the 180 degree rule says that all your cameras need to be on the same side of the venue. So looking at a football or a basketball arena, uh, it doesn't matter which side, but pick one side or the other, and that's where all of your cameras need to be. Now, they can go all the way out to the baseline, like for free throw shooting or stuff like that. You can go all the way out to that, you know, this corner right here where it says Mustangs. Um, that's totally fine, but you don't want to put cameras on the opposite side because if you do, it disorients the viewer um, when you're moving right to left or left to right. This really doesn't apply to baseball and softball, but it certainly applies to any sport that's on a gridiron or soccer, lacrosse, etc., uh, basketball, volleyball, etc., that are on these rectangular playing surfaces, keep all of your gear on one side, which is probably what you would have done anyway, because otherwise it takes a massive amount of cable and then trying to figure out how to not have people trip on it or run it across the playing surface. So that's probably what you would have done anyway, but just keep that in mind. You don't want cameras on opposite sides of the arena because it will disorient your viewer when you switch between them. All right, so now let's take a look at football slash soccer slash lacrosse stadium kind of events. So you're going to position your rig in the press box, which is at the bottom center of this image. Um, press box is where you have power, which is important, of course, and it is also where we have our internet connection. And it's also just a convenient place that is sheltered from the elements um, where we can sit down and get all of this gear set up. So that's where your, uh, your point of origin is for the broadcast. If you only have one camera, you're going to mount it on top of the press box or the highest available point, uh, top row of the bleachers, etc. if you don't have a press box. And that's going to be your wide shot. It's as high as possible and as close as possible to midfield on one side of the field far enough away to capture the full width and at least one third of the length of the playing area when it's fully zoomed out. This camera is going to be used the most and it is the default fallback. If you don't have a good shot anywhere else, this is the camera you're going to go to. Certainly when the ball is live, this is almost always the camera that you're going to be going to. And if you only have one camera, this is the camera. If you have a second camera available, you would put that at the sideline or baseline. Now, in this diagram, which is based on Wakaiva's setup, I have it still in the stands, at the front of the stands, which is still a little bit elevated. In a perfect world, you would actually put this on the sideline. The reason we don't is because that requires a prohibitively long cable run, and 
then we have to deal with the cheerleaders and making sure nobody trips on it. Um, and also dealing with the football players on the sidelines and having them not crash into the equipment, et cetera. Not to mention we don't have anywhere to elevate the camera if we were to put it on the sideline, and then you're trying to shoot over the players and the coaches. So for that reason, even though it would be better if we put it on the sideline, we put it actually still in the stands, but closer and not as elevated as the main camera on top of the press box. If you have a third camera, then you can do the same shot, but from the other side. So typically, if you have a choice, you want it on the side that the home team is scoring touchdowns on. Um, but if you have an option to have two of them, then that gives you even more angles. And the other thing is you, this keeps the cameras as far apart as possible so that the angles are meaningfully different than each other than if you put the two cameras next to each other. The other nice thing about these angles is that you can actually turn the cameras around and point them into the crowd and get audience reaction shots. And then if you have a fourth camera, then you put it right next to the first camera on top of the press box. And the difference is that this is gonna be your tight shot. Um, so this camera is gonna zoom in more closely on the action and it's gonna provide, uh, the wide shot provides relief when this camera needs to pan rapidly to change its shot. Because you don't want to give your audience whiplash um, if you need to throw the camera from one part of the field to the other quickly. So you cut to your wide shot, then reorient your tight shot and then cut back to your tight shot. Um, this is also great if you want to do anything with instant replay um, so that your, your tight shot can be used for the instant replay and the wide shot is used for the original play because during the original play, you don't know where the ball is going to go. But afterward, if your tight shot got a good shot on it, you can use that for the replay. We don't always use four cameras. We don't even often use four cameras. But if we had four cameras, this would be the optimal position for them. All right, let's go inside. So this will be for... Um, volleyball and basketball uh, wrestling is also done here but the camera positioning rules for wrestling are kind of different with wrestling you just put them wherever they can catch the action but for basketball and volleyball your rig is going to be positioned at half court probably at or near the score table and so if you have one camera and one camera only then you are going to mount that as high and as far back as possible as close as you can to half court. Um, and then you're gonna run that straight into your broadcast rig. Um, and again, if you only have one camera, this is the camera. Uh, and if you have more than one camera, this is still your main camera. During live ball situations, it's gonna be almost the only camera you use. Um, and during dead ball situations, you can still use it. Um, it's gonna be the camera that gets the most airtime. If you have a second camera, might put it behind the baseline or maybe in the corner. This is going to be great for foul shots, um, also great for under the basket um, when you have, you know, dunks or layups or whatever. Uh, great for instant replay. Um, so what you can do, like I said earlier, even if you don't have the high-end instant replay operation on your broadcast rig, uh, what you do is you film with the wide shot and then you have your... Um, your tight shot operator over here on the baseline, you have them shuttle back the camera 10 seconds, put it in playback mode, shuttle it back 10 seconds, and then start it playing back. Then you cut to that camera. Then when it gets close to the end of the playback, you cut back to the wide shot. And that's your poor man's instant replay. Um, so you can do stuff like that too. Obviously you can use it live for foul shots, etc. cetera. Um, if you only have two cameras, then pick whichever side the home team is shooting at. And that's the side you want to put your other camera on. Of course, the teams rotate at halftime. So we usually put it on the side they're going to be shooting at at the end of the game. If you have a third camera, then you do exactly the same thing, but on the other side of the court. And if you have a fourth camera, then just like in football, you mount it right next to your wide shot camera. Um, and you're going to use that for tight shots um, so that you can use those to kind of give a little variety. You can focus on coaches, focus on players, focus on the action. Um, it's just that that's obviously less versatile, so you don't do that unless you already have the wide shot established. Let's move out to the baseball field. Um, so in baseball, in a perfect world, we would like to have the, the rig inside the press box. The problem is we really can't do that um, because it's the cable runs are too long and because of the bizarre way that our facilities are built at Wakaiva, um, you actually don't get a good view from the press box like as the operator of, 
of the of the live stream, you actually can't see home plate that well unless you lean out the window. So as a result, we put our broadcast production rig over here, um, just out just behind the backstop and off to the side a little bit where we've got a shady spot with a tree. If you have one and only one camera, you are going to put it immediately behind the backstop. You're going to press it all the way up against the chain link fence and shoot through the fence and zoom out as much as you can without having the chain link in the shot. Um, and that's going to be your main camera. Um, it covers all of the infield and most of the outfield. It's staring right down the barrel of the pitcher. Um, and so you're going to use that um, certainly for pitching situations. Um, and then, like I said, you still get a good view of the outfield uh, for when the ball is in play. If you have a second camera, we put it up in the press box, um, which is elevated. It's above the home dugout. This would be called your high first or your high third camera uh, in professional broadcasting. Uh, it's mounted high above the field on either the first or third base side because our press box is on the third base side. That's where we put it. This is a little closer than you would like to have it. Ideally, you'd actually like it to be a little bit closer to third base, but this is fine for our purposes because that's where we have a platform that we can put it without chain link in front of it. Um, and this gives you a great bird's eye view. Uh, certainly that's great for, for pickoff attempts at first. Um, it's great for base running. It's great for if the ball goes into right field for fly catches and stuff like that. Um, that's a great angle for that. If you have a third camera, then you would go low first or low third. So this is at ground level. It's inside the chain link fence. So you'll need someone who's a little bit braver to operate this camera. Um, you want it closer to first or third base than to home plate, but not quite parallel. Again, in a perfect world, we would actually have this camera on the other side of the visitor dugout, which is that gray area that you see on this diagram. But uh, because of cable limitations and also limitations on where the empires will allow us to stand, we typically have it a little bit closer, a little bit more parallel with the pitcher's mound. Uh, again, this camera is great for pickoff attempts at first, great for base running, um, good angles on uh, left field if the ball goes out there. Um, in a professional broadcast, you would generally see a camera behind center field as well. But at the high school level, you really don't have an opportunity to do that because it would require prohibitive amounts of cable. Um, also, there's no power back there, and we have no apparatus that we could mount a camera on that would see above the chain link. So uh, we don't have an opportunity to do that, but that would be your other typical location for a professional camera. Moving to the softball field, softball field's a little trickier because it uses smaller dimensions than the baseball field, but otherwise the same principles apply. Um, Again, in a perfect world, you'd like to put the rig inside the press box. Uh, we end up not doing that because, again, the press box, which is that gray box that you see above first base, um, is built so close to the field that you actually can't see home plate while seated inside the press box, and it's a terrible location to actually watch the game from. So as a result, we usually end up putting it uh, just off-center behind the backstop. Camera number one, same idea as baseball. Goes straight behind the backstop, shoots through the chain link. You press it right up against the chain link and zoom out as far as you can. This is not as good as baseball because there's the smaller dimensions of the softball field. It's harder to get as wide of an angle in the softball field, but you do the best you can. Uh, just like with baseball, this camera typically is unmanned because it never moves. Uh, it doesn't pan, it doesn't zoom, uh, it doesn't go anywhere just a static shot so you don't even need an operator for this camera you just have to watch if a foul ball goes directly into the backstop and, and bounces it off of where it should be or uh, screws up the angle then you may have to go fix it but otherwise um, you don't need an operator for that camera if we have a second camera available again you'd like to put this high like in the press box unfortunately at Wakaiva the press box has chain link over it um, and that makes it difficult to shoot through. So we can't put it inside or above the press box. So we have to put it on the field. So this is a low third base camera um, and that becomes our second camera. Uh, unfortunately, that's about it. That's all we can do with softball. If we were going to use a third camera, we would position it in the same place on the first base side of the field. The reason we don't typically do that is because there's no power at Rakaiva's softball field on the visitor dugout side like there is on the home dugout side. So if we were going to do that, we would need a battery pack for both the camera and the HDMI to SDI adapter or a really long extension cord. 
Finally, let's talk about personnel, how you can best utilize your human resources depending on how many you have available to participate in the broadcast. So first, I want to mention the zero-person crew option. We use this occasionally at Wakaiva, especially if we have more than one sport going on at the same time. Um, Orange County actually got Pixelot cameras mounted for us at the football and the basketball uh, venues. So the stadium and the gym have these. Um, this is not as good as a human-operated production. It uses artificial intelligence to have the camera follow the action as best it can. Um, you technically can put audio into it to do announcers, but it's problematic in the gym because the equipment is across the hall, um, and so you can't easily run cables to where the announcers can actually see the game. When it comes to scoreboard data, the Pixelot will integrate with that. In the arena, it actually uses an optical character recognition camera pointed at the scoreboard to read the scoreboard in real time down to the tenths of a second and put that onto an automatic graphics display in the broadcast. At the football stadium, it actually uses a sportscast scorelink device, just like we would use for a human-operated broadcast that goes directly into the video processing unit and does the scoreboard unmanned. The other downside to the Pixelot is that it will only send it to NFHS Network. Uh, we cannot stream to YouTube uh, or any other destination. So, uh, like I said, this is our fallback. Um, the, you, it is not as smart as a human as far as tracking the action, um, and you lose some of the more professional, shinier things that you can do with a broadcast, but it certainly is better than nothing if we don't have a broadcast crew available or if multiple things are going on at the same time and we're spread too thin and we can't cover all of it. So for the rest of these scenarios, let's assume that you do have a crew, starting with a one-person crew. And in each of these scenarios, I'm not counting the announcers. If you have a multi-talented individual who can announce while doing camera or directing or producing work, that's great. Or if you have dedicated announcers who are going to be additional to this crew, that's also great. But I'm not counting them in these scenarios. A one-person crew is definitely not ideal, but it can be done. So with a one-person crew, you're, the one and only thing that they're going to do is run that camera one. Uh, the wide shot camera operator, in this case, you would either move your broadcast production rig to the same place as the wide shot camera so that the same person can monitor the broadcast and also run the camera, or you can take your chances uh, before the game. You set up your broadcast production rig, you plug everything in, you turn it on, you start it streaming, and then you cross your fingers and hope it works. The good news is, if you only have one camera, you don't need a director because there isn't, there isn't anything to choose. You don't have to choose which camera, you don't have to choose a shot, you don't have to mix anything because you only have one choice. And so you don't need a director for that. Um, and like I said, it's, it's a little dangerous to not have somebody minding the store, um, making sure that the stream is actually healthy and nothing goes wrong and all the cables are solid and snug and everything, but it can be done. You just set it and forget it and then go run the camera. If you have a two-person crew, then you still tend to stick with a one camera setup, but now you actually have somebody who can sit at the computer and they function as director. Again, as a director, they don't really have a lot to do because there's only one camera to choose from. Uh, they can be a graphics operator, so they can uh, adjust your scoreboard, turn it on and off, uh, and then also function as your producer. And when I say producer for the purposes of this, I'm talking about monitoring the broadcast, monitoring the health of the broadcast, moderating your YouTube live chat comments, um, etc. Um, making sure the broadcast is, is working, um, which sort of makes them an engineer. So that is kind of an all-in-one role. Obviously, in the professional world, you would never put all of those responsibilities on the same person, but uh, at the amateur level, it certainly happens. If you have a third person on your broadcast crew, then you can add a second camera, assuming you have the equipment to do that. Uh, put them on the sideline or baseline. Um, Handheld is the professional way to do this, but obviously only if you have a camera that is a steady cam and that is made for handheld. Otherwise, you will make your audience seasick unless your camera operator is really expert at not wobbling it, which is a lot harder than it sounds. If you have four people available on your broadcast crew, you can now add a second sideline or baseline camera on the opposite side, in addition to your wide shot camera and your director. And now the director really has something to do. The director is actually choosing shots dealing with graphics and whatnot. If you have a five-person crew and enough equipment, you can add a fourth camera. So you've got your two in the bird's nest, um, 
you've got two on the sidelines of the baseline, and then you've got one guy at the center of it who is directing traffic. Um, he is radioing to the camera operators to give them direction on what shots to take, uh, choosing the shots, um, and actually controlling the broadcast through the mixing software. If you have a six-person crew, then you can split up the director's responsibilities who's standing at the computer and maybe not have that person doing literally everything on the computer. So you can have one person who is actually directing the mixing software and who's choosing shots and giving direction to camera operators and turning the graphics on and off. But then don't make them responsible for actually monitoring and producing the broadcast. So you have that second person now um, is going to use another laptop to monitor the broadcast, uh, moderate the live chat, tweet, post to Facebook, you know, give game updates on social media, promote the live stream, etc. Um, you can take that producing role and separate it from the directing role and actually put it on a separate computer because there's no reason that those things need to be done from the same computer that's actually producing the broadcast. Obviously, a professional uh, setup is going to have way more than this. Um, a professional setup, you're going to have a dedicated person doing the graphics. You're going to have a dedicated person directing. You're going to have a dedicated person doing instant replay. You're going to have a dedicated engineer who's monitoring the broadcast. You're going to have a dedicated audio engineer. But this is assuming that you're trying to scrape by using minimal uh, crew and equipment. So that wraps up this presentation. Before we go, I want to give you a couple of other resources. So I'm going to put some links in the description of this video to some other tutorials that we produced last year on how to actually set up those graphics and how to use vMix. Um, and how to get the data from the scoreboard into vMix and some of the other more technical aspects. Uh, again, that's just one way of doing it. It's not the only way to do it. There's also a resource that I think is kind of cool. Um, ESPN3 has a document that they put out for major universities that are going to produce their own games for ESPN3. And they have their technical requirements and their glossary. That's a great resource as well. But hopefully that's been helpful uh, just to kind of take you on a tour of what's involved in doing basic live streaming of live sporting events and how to at least make it look professional even if you're not using $25,000 plus professional equipment um, and even if you don't have the army of personnel that would be required at the professional level how you can make a professional looking broadcast for live sports and if you have any questions uh, certainly feel free to drop us a line in the comments um, or contact mark.barchi at ocps.net and I will be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks for tuning in.